Hello and welcome back to the live stream at the Guest Education Global Leadership Summit and this panel and this panel discussion, Sustainability Education for a Better Future. Thank you all very much for joining us. It's great to have you here with us for this session. Just a few bits of housekeeping for anyone that hasn't joined us yet today. You'll see a chat panel there located on the right hand side of your screen. Please feel free to ask any questions you have for our panel. These are being moderated and we'll do our best to pass these on uh, to the speakers throughout the session. Um, I think that's more than enough for me and all you guys need to know. So I'll pass you over to the chair of the session, Katia Al Casey, founder of Education House Finland, who can introduce you to the rest of our, our panel. Over to you, Katia. Thank you very much, Barney, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. So as, as Barney mentioned, my name is Katja Alkaisi. I'm founder and CEO of Education House Finland. Uh, we're based out of Helsinki and, and Dubai. Um, and I'm very happy today to be chairing this panel and this discussion about sustainability education for a better future. Uh, I would like to ask my fellow panelists to introduce themselves. So um, I will start from how I see the panelists on the screen next to me. I think it's a bit different for everyone. So Brett, if you can please tell us uh, what you do and, and how, how does sustainability education kind of uh, appear in your daily life? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Katia. Um, Brett Gervin. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be the principal at the Arbor School here in Dubai. Uh, it's an ecological school based in the British curriculum. And you can see here in the background, I'm lucky enough to be sitting in what we call our reflection garden. Uh, me personally, my journey has, uh, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wayward Kiwi, New Zealander, who's found his way to the Middle East. My, my background was growing up on the beaches and the mountains and the forests of New Zealand, which was very formative for me in terms of where I went with my future education. Studied zoology um, and with, it, with, I guess, a focus on marine critters. Uh, and then went into environmental science. And then that led me eventually to education and went around the whole loop before I eventually wound up at this fantastic school, um, which is an ecological school. So how does sustainability for education manifest daily? It's, it's my day. It's my day from start to finish. So I'm, I'm very lucky in that uh, for us, sustainability is not a bolt-on. It's the core of what we do. And I guess I'll get a chance later to chat more about it. But we, we focus on eco-literacy as opposed to um, just merely sustainability. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Brent. Hind? Uh, thank you, Katya. Uh, so my name is Hind al Uh I'm the director of education at BIA, which is the environmental uh, sustainability pioneer in the Middle East. Uh, I have been working with BIA close to 10 years right now. And uh, my background is actually in environmental sciences. So I actually wanted to work in a field that actually matches my uh, studies. Uh, so as the director of education, I'm in charge of uh, delivering environmental education to whether it's schools, communities, organizations, universities. So it's all about increasing environmental knowledge and having more of a focus on both uh, sustainability and environmental uh, management. Thank you, and uh, Elena. Okay, greetings from Finland. Uh, my name is Elena Lehtimäki and I work in Helsinki Metropolitan Area Reuse Center. We have environmental school and I work there as an environmental education specialist. And my background is also in environmental sciences, but just before my graduation, I found the environmental education and fell in love, if I could say so. I have worked with it ever since, almost 20 years now. And I have also a teacher qualification and I work with children of all ages from kindergarten until upper secondary and also we train teachers and educators and design and make teaching materials. Um, actually, this is how I get to know him last year when we got the opportunity to design new teaching materials for Bea. And and I work in Rio Center, and our goal is to preserve natural resources and raise environment, environmental awareness. And the environmental school was born with the Rio Center 30 years ago. And most of my colleagues are teachers and educators, and we believe that the education and positive experiences are the key to make a change. And my personal favorite topics are sustainable consumption and circular economy. And I'm really glad and excited to join this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Peter. 
Hi, well, good afternoon from a, a sunny spring day in England. Um, I'm Peter Milne. I'm the founder and director of a company called Target for Green, which is an educational consultancy company that focuses on climate change and sustainability education. Uh, my background is teaching. I was a teacher for over 20 years. Um, I worked initially in the UK um, and also worked in international schools in Malaysia. Um, I ended up in Dubai from 2005 to 2015. I worked in two schools, um, one an IB school and one a British curriculum school. Um, in the IB school, which was the last school I worked as a teacher, I was environmental education coordinator, and it was one of the first schools that came onto the Eco Schools program. Um, I spent the last three years of, of my time in Dubai as a freelance consultant trainer, uh, ended up working with over 40 schools in Sharjah, um, Abu Dhabi and, and Dubai. Um, also working with corporate to develop educational programs as well. Um, I'm now back in the UK, have been since 2015, but still have strong connections with Dubai. Uh, and I work with schools, not just in the UK, but all, all across the world on um, workshops, through workshops, assemblies, and in particular, big event planning that uh, I focus on at the moment. Thank you very much. Like we, we have such a great group here and, and from all over the world and even different emirates in the uae so i think it's 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 good to start the discussion uh with with the why and and uh brett i i know it's it's even wider than sustainability in education you talk about about the echo school and echo education but but why would you do that at school um well i guess the bigger question now is probably why not because <laughs> if not now, then when? Uh, and, and we don't have time to sort of put the brakes on in some things. We actually need to back this bus up because we're already over the edge of the cliff. So it's a bigger question of why not rather than why. But um, sustainability is, is the thread that, particularly in my school, that runs through everything, but it's more of an outcome. So until we understand the, sort of the view we take here at my school, um, the, the concepts that govern ecology, is that we're not going to be able to apply those to make sustainable human communities. So the teaching of sustainability needs to be more than just a bolt-on. I think I said that at the beginning, it has to be a thread that runs through everything. Um, and I think one of the, you know, in, in most countries, particularly where, where education is um, sort of outlined by the government, it's not a private um, process, is that it's, it's designed to be a social good. It's designed by the government to sort of elicit and, and reflect the things which are, are valued in the community. So. We should be valuing sustainability, absolutely. We should be valuing community, um, sustainability in the community. And so we need to build that in as an essential part of what we do. Um, and, and, you know, it, it has to be education, not indoctrination. So we're not, we're not trying to create everyone to be an eco-warrior. You know, we need those revolutionaries who are going to drag the norm from left to right to right to left, which is where we're headed. But what we actually need to do is just shift the norm a little bit. So, I mean, we're already talking about new normals here um, after COVID, but actually we need a new normal for sustainability where all these actions that we're talking about now as a change towards, those need to become the default position. So we need to shift the entire community and create a new norm where sustainability is built in. It is, it is the norm. There would be no other possible way to achieve these goals. So I think doing it, you know, raising sustainability as a, as a critical part of education is it's not optional anymore. It needs to be in there. That's that's so interesting how you said the new normal. I think when I had a chat with Peter earlier, he he he, he mentioned like as a, an example how quickly we reacted to the pandemic. We reacted within days, and it's something we might be able to control, and it goes away. But but the problem with the planet is is not going away if we don't react. But sometimes humans act in funny ways, like when it's not an imminent or like something that we can actually see. Yeah, um, Hind, you you are like a a, a a corporate like Bia is 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 a company like, uh, but you're one of the leaders, if not actually the leader in the Middle East in this type of education. Like, why why did Bia start doing that? Or again, maybe maybe why not? But I would like to hear it from from your perspective. Like, uh, why would a, why would a commercial corporation take into this education and spend money into it and all that? Um, so as you said, VIA has been, you know, the leader when it comes to sustainability and environmental management in the Middle East. And since its inception back in 2007, one of the core things that was actually within the mandate of VIA in its 
establishment is to deliver environmental education within the school communities and the general public as well. We believe that's something that's very important because in order for us to go around achieving what we have achieved with BIA over the past 13 years, if we didn't have the foundation, the right foundation of education and awareness set in place, that would not have been possible because it all starts with educating the younger generation who would be able to educate their peers, their friends, and their families back at home. So it's all about creating something that is very engaging with the youth, I would say. That's why we established the BS School of Environment, um, I would say now for 11 years. It has been running uh, very successfully. It's a program that has reached all the schools within the UAE. We have over 500 schools taking part in the program, over 250,000 students that are part of the program. That's why um, we you know, decided to take on this route and because we believe that education and awareness is something that's very important. We're linking it to a variety of topics. You know, We're talking about the SDGs and a lot of it when it goes to environmental protection, climate change, or whether it's even inequality or poverty, all of it you know, falls under the SDG, which is something that we're also trying to you know, advocate and push you know, for. That's why you know, since, as I said at the beginning, it was something that was very important for BL. Yeah, I mean, it is in the S in the in the SDGs, right? Sometimes we we forget or we 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 look at the SDGs like where was the one about environment? Well, they're all about you know about a sustainable future, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes. Yeah, um, Elena, maybe it would be interesting, like, to understand how is this how is uh, in, in like sustainability education taught in Finland, maybe from, 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 an, from an educational level, just, just as a background for the listeners, Finland's education system is quite homogeneous, like 95% of the schools are state-run and, and run on a, on a similar, similar curriculum or on the national curriculum. But it would be interesting if, if you tell us a bit, how is it, how is it actually taught at schools? Yes, this is a... <laughs> brief lecture about the curriculum in Finland. Uh, so the, the basic education in Finland is based on national as well as the local curriculum. And the local curriculum links schools to um, actively to other, other local activities. And the national curriculum, it's, it aims strongly to guide pupils towards a sustainable way of life and understanding the importance of sustainable development. And it's in really it's it's seen as really important that children learn to take responsibility and learn to make choices that build a sustainable future. After all, all they are the future makers as well as we are. Um, uh, and it's considered important also that students are given the opportunity to make an impact and also learn to work for the environment. Uh, for example, uh, many schools have pupils, uh, environmental team, and the team plans and organizes environmental activities at schools. Uh, usually the team has one elected pupil from each of the classes. Uh, in bigger schools, about more than 600 students, they might have more than one team, so that the younger and the older ones have their own team. And the sustainable in the curriculum is written in every subject, so it doesn't matter if you teach math or geography. Um, and the curriculum includes also seven transversal competencies and one of the goals of the competencies is participation, impact and building a sustainable future. So the curriculum really takes sustainability into consideration. Mm. So that it's not uh, taught yeah. as a separate subject as such, like it's it's embedded in, 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 in all. Yeah, it's in everything. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And schools also make their own environmental programs for school year. And usually the teachers have also environmental team as well as the students. And the teachers team, it plans how environmental issues are implemented during the school year. For example, they might have some theme week or the school may offer optional subjects with an environmental theme. 
but that's that's about the how the curriculum and how the schools work in this right. field. Very, very interesting. I, I would like to come back to, to, to you how, how you do it in your organization. But before that, like Peter, as you said, you work with tens of schools in the UAE. Uh, can, how, how do you see it done here? Like how, how, is, how is the practice here? Of course, we have 17 different curriculums in the UAE, but we have a few common ones, of course. So how, how, how would you describe that? Well, I mean, I can go back to when I when I sort of first started in in, uh, in Dubai when I first lived there from 2005, just to kind sort of show you how I feel the whole thing has evolved since that time, because it has been a, a lot a lot of positive change with schools during that period of time, and and since I left as well, obviously being been back in touch with many schools since then. Um, I think we have to look at how schools have been supported from the corporate level and also the government level. And also through NGOs as well, because that's that's the sort of the support network, if you like. There are now, you know, the Eco Schools the program was brought in in 2010. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with BR actually on their School of Environment during the time I was there as well. So that's evolved and and stretched into into lots of different schools. Um, obviously, you have the Sustainable Schools program, which is the Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi. Uh, sustainable Champions Program, Minister of uh, Ed Ministry of Education. So you have all these these programs that schools can tap into. Now within the curriculum, obviously there are certain curricula that fit better, if you like, with sustainability. But it can't just be about the curriculum that you follow. It's about also the leadership of the school, um, the the sort of support and 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 consistent support of of leadership. Um, a critical element I think schools um, need to have, or some certainly do have, is a dedicated role within that school that is, I mean, whether you call it a sustainability lead or environmental education coordinator, whatever it is, it's a role that's really critical. No matter what curricula you, you are under, it's having that role within the school gives you a focal point. And not only that is that role something that's accountable and responsible, but also something that's really important to be rewarded for because I've I've sort of known teachers who've kind of taken on the, the eco warrior kind of um, role within a school, but they're doing it very much on their own back and they're not giving that that sort of um, guaranteed position that, that sort of supports them to do the work on a consistent basis. So when that teacher leaves, for example, there isn't anybody to replace them. So I think that's something that also all schools, no matter what curriculum they're involved in, um, need to look at as, as well uh, as, as supporting. Um, I think you know you, you'd say that the IB curriculum is is a is a better fit, but I've worked with uh, Indian curriculum schools, and it's and it's not so much about the curriculum; it's just the passion of the students and the teachers and the leadership that drives it. That's the driving force, and they they are the ones that really get involved in outside programs that you know such as BR or or the Emirates um, Nature, the WWF programs, and those kind of programs, they reach out and they use the, that support that's out there to to support them. And I think it's so you don't feel as a as a school that you're kind of too isolated. You you've got other people out there, other networks out there to support you as well. Um, and that's how I see it, it has having evolved during that time massively. You know, it's just in that 2005. I remember when I first worked at a school as a teacher. Uh, we had a unit on recycling, but we didn't have any, re any recycling within the school. So it was all theoretical and no practical. And that's definitely changed now. It's, it's a lot better than it, than it was before. Okay, very, very interesting and positive change. Um, Brett, when, when we talked before this, we also touched a little bit upon the curriculum and that, that uh, Arbor is uh, following UK national curriculum, but you have tweaked a little bit what you follow, right? Or that you have tried to embed, embed sustainability also not only as an add-on, but actually within everything you do at the school, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, uh, <clears throat> and I don't think there's any completely right answer here, but what, what Peter's saying is 100% correct. Teachers are passionate and given any opportunity, they're going to make as many networks as they can and grab as many opportunities as they can to bring this to life for the children because everyone wants to really make this happen. Um, to really get that dedicated change, we need probably a move toward what um, Eleanor was explaining, where this thing is mandated. It is a fixed-in part of everything. But 
we're heading that way. But potentially, I mean, particularly at my school, it, it, I think the important part of sustainability, again, is it's not just content. You're not just teaching stuff. It's it's a head, hands, heart change. It's a transformational change from the ground up. So it's not just more content. It's actually experiences. So what does that look like for our youngest children? It means getting out in nature. It means getting out and, and valuing making mud pies and playing in the grass and looking for bugs and, and doing that. And on the surface level, it looks just like the children are playing. But as we all know, you know, children learn through play at the youngest year groups and, and actually throughout the school. As they grow older, you add just layers of complexity. So when the little ones went to the pond, you know, they saw turtles and they laughed and they played and they giggled and they snored all the ammunition away. But as they get slightly older, then you add layers of complexity. So, well, actually, the pond's a system. Sun feeds the algae, algae feed the fish, fish feed the turtles, etc. And so it's a system. And systems have rules. And systems are nested within other systems. And so as each year group, um, you know, as they gain complexity and understanding, as you add complexity, into your explanations and so you, you touch say, well if this this system has rules this ecosystem has rules can we apply it to a different ecosystem um and and then as you can see you build that up and up and up until the children are applying those rules of ecosystems into other bigger human problems right if that's how that works do those same rules apply to fish farming do those same rules apply to the solving of the challenge that we have with COVID, etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's, it's not just content, and I think that's a danger people see is it's, it's not just content. We don't have to just teach them about global warming. It's not just activities. We don't do the stuff outside of class with we, the eco council or we're doing a sustainability trip or we're off to do a beach cleanup. Those things are all important, but this is a, it's a head, hands, heart transformation. So it has to begin from the ground level up. It has to be central to what we're trying to achieve. And, you know, for large scale change, um, you know, at the rate at which we need it to happen. It probably needs to be federal and government level mandate um, until we're going to see it happen everywhere. Until then, you know, educators, parents, kids, I mean, who doesn't want to get outside and make mud pies? It's fantastic. So the experiences are actually the easy bit. It's really building it into everything to make sure it's sustainable and consistent and it doesn't disappear when that one passionate teacher disappears. Yeah. So maybe a way to embed it in the curriculum might be a, <laughs> might be a way like like they've done it, for example, in Finland, because you kind of need to then do it as well. But of course, you need to be engaged and passionate as an educator. And the Absolutely. most important thing you need to engage and, and motivate the children and the students. So, Hind, I want to ask you, because you've been doing this also for, for a long time, like how has it evolved? Like you've seen the you use different methods with the children at, at BSO and, and all that. Like what are the things that mostly engage students and that you see uh, give like um, have impact uh, on, on, on their attitudes towards towards sustainability? Um, I would say like the main thing that we started focusing on uh, since we started the BSOE program was trying to really stay away from traditional teaching methods because we try to put ourselves in a student's perspective. The last thing they need is to have another person coming and giving them a lecture. You know, we wanted something to be different, something to be very interactive and engaging so that we can grab their attention, but in an impactful way. That's why our uh, I would say learning and uh, teaching approach was uh, a blended you know, tool that we are actually utilizing. So we do have that interactivity with the teachers and the students where, I mean, this was pre-COVID where we had the team actually going to visit the schools, um, mm -hmm. doing a lot of you know, interactive learning, a lot of hands-on workshops, because you know, with the younger kids, we believe in you know, teaching by actually practicing. So if they're actually practicing and doing hands-on activities and workshops, you know, on their own, it embeds the idea more into their heads. We're currently doing the same thing, but obviously we're doing it uh, right now virtually due to all the restrictions that we have. But we're also focusing on having a lot of learning resources because, I mean, I'm sure uh, Brett would, would know this, him being a principal when it comes to, you know, educators, like their time is already occupied with, you know, their own teaching materials. So sometimes they don't really have the time or even the credited resources in order to go and teach and deliver environmental resources. That's why we developed a website with full access, you know, to environmental education and knowledge, which is accessible to, you know, both teachers and students. It's all interactive, whether it's a, it's a game or it's a video or it's an activity or a quiz, a simple quiz that they can actually solve. It would teach them a lot of information about the environment, but it can be made in an easy, fun, and most importantly, impactful and informative way. 
We also try to introduce or introduce actually within the last two years, a lot of interactive and um, um, gamified learning. And that's how, you know, Elena and I, you know, met because we were working on one of the games actually, because we wanted to also steer away from just maybe trying to give them, you know, information directly and try to focus more on having, you know, a game with different levels. It's still informative. You're still learning something at the end, but it's more engaging so that they know as if they're, you know, going through a maze, going through puzzles. So it's more interesting and interactive. And another game that we also launched uh, recently is also an application that focuses on waste management, waste segregation, teaching them the practices. So it's all about engaging with the youth. And what we've also learned and noticed from COVID is that the students are on their iPads right now. So if you need to grab your, their attention, mm -hmm. you need to do something that's very interesting. So having an application and interactive learning is a guaranteed way of you capturing their attention and actually them doing something that's different other than them just putting an iPad and listening to a teacher, you know, give them a lecture all day long. So that's what you know we've been trying to focus on it's more of you know interactive and um you know gamified education and learning no, no that sounds excellent and is um is your portal open for everyone in the uae or is it open to other countries in the gulf like how how how, how is yes it? right now it's open to all the schools in the uae and uh, due to the recent expansion of bia in both ksa and egypt we will open up the portal to both countries because it doesn't make sense for us just to limit it to the uae so we will expand it to all the countries that we actually have a presence in Okay, now we have a question from the audience whether it will be in Kuwait, but maybe hopefully it will expand to Kuwait in the yes, near future. Hopefully in the near future, yes. Yeah. So Elena, maybe you could share like some uh, like we heard you were you work together on gamification, so I assume you use those methods. Any other methods on on how how to engage uh, students from different ages and within from your organization? What kind of solutions? How have they evolved? What works? Uh, well, I think it's quite quite the same as what Bia does and the Arbor School. It's learning by doing and hands-on learning. We don't give lectures. We always do something. And nowadays it's distance teaching. And we also have um, uh, outdoor education. We go to schoolyards and we use the surroundings of the school. We go to seashores and explore the water and that sort of mm, but I, I I thought that I would open you a little bit about how we in general do it in Finland so you get the idea is that okay yeah of course <laughs> okay so we all know that the curriculum it co it's it consists of really big teams and they are really they are challenges for the teachers but we we have these several external actors that can help teachers and schools to achieve the the curriculum objectives and in finland we have a national network that promotes nature and environmental education and the resources for building this network it has been around I think 10 to 15 years but the resources have come from the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Education and Culture and it means that environmental education is seen really important also in the national administration and the network which we are part of uh, it consists, consists of approximately I think 50 centers and members. Uh, there are, for example, nat nature and environmental schools, uh, visitor centers of national parks, and then some uh, camp school centers also. And and we are we are a part of that network, and we all offer educative programs for school classes and training courses as well as teacher materials for te teaching materials for teachers and uh, of course nature schools they focus on deepening the relationship with the nature and then the environmental schools promote more the sustainability but of course we try to connect our topics to the big picture that deals with climate change and loss of diversity so we we make visits to schools, as I told, and classes also visit us 
for example, in the reuse center. And now it's more or less the distance teaching and outdoor education. It's, it's not impossible to go to the classroom. But all the programs um, uh, are and trainings that we offer, they are all based on the national curriculum. And I think that's, that's how the system in the wide range, how it works in Finland. Okay. We are just one of, one of the, <laughs> the outside uh, partners that, that work with teachers and schools. Thanks, Elena. Um, there is another question again, if, but we got the answer from, from Hind about the resources where they're available. But Peter, you, you have a wide network and you mentioned a lot of bodies and official uh, routes in the UAE. Would you know any good uh, portals where schools could access materials or outside the UAE where there would be available some resources for educators that are that are that can be made use of? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there are, there are some excellent organizations out there based in the UAE, just, just to name a few. Uh, I talked about Emirates uh, Nature World Wildlife Fund. They, they do a lot of uh, work with schools as well. Uh, also and outside, uh, yeah. The question, sorry, was also outside. Yeah, you, you think they have them online? Like, or like, what what would be resources for for educators outside UAE to access? Um, well, the, there's certain sort of international networks. There's obviously the Eco Schools International Network, which is um, in at least sixty or seventy different countries. But international schools can also join the Eco Schools program. And the, I mean, I've, I've worked with the Eco Schools program as, as an environmental educator. It gives you a very good structure. Um, it, it sort of gives you guidelines. Obviously, the, the, the main work is done through the school, but the Eco Schools network is, is a good one to tap into. Um, Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots program, which, which has got a heavy presence in the UAE, but also, is also an international program, really sort of focuses on looking after nature as well. So there's, there's a number of different organizations, obviously World Wildlife Fund, uh, these bigger ones. But I think it's also important to try and track down local organizations that really have a heart and soul. Because these big, big sort of NGOs, obviously they support internationally. But, you know, when I when I um, organize events, and in fact, I, I did organize an event uh, recently in Kuwait or virtually in Kuwait, I, I looked for um supporting local small organizations that could then network and, and link up with schools to support them further because i think there's always teachers who want to do the best they can but they're full-time teachers they they can't do everything so having that sort of in school support from different organizations or companies that can come in or work online um is is really the way to go but looking local so you look you learn more about local um, issues and you can get very much involved in local uh, networks and also local projects um, hands-on stuff as well so i would recommend anybody to look at wherever they are in the world to look at supporting their, their local network of um, organizations thank you thank you for 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 those tips uh peter okay so i don't think um we could have, unfortunately, a, a talk without without like reflecting on our current situation and the current pandemic and 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 the COVID COVID situation. So, I mean, unfortunately, like it's 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 official that that all we're, we're we are behind on on all the SDG targets, even the ones that were on track a year ago. Uh, due to the pandemic, there has been a huge negative impact. Um, also, when I when we look at all the amount of masks and gloves and all that, it's it's horrifying. On the other hand, we saw during lockdowns like clear blue skies and and dolphins swimming next to the shores and all that. So, so how do you how do you see it? Like, how do you see it in your in your in your daily life? How has it affected the like sustainability education? Maybe we could we could get up, go around for a, for a quick comment. If you could start, Brett, please. Um, I, know, I, I think it's impacted on schools operationally. Um, first of all, so it's tricky to sort of say access to spaces, small things. So we, we have gardens and things like that, but we can't have as many people using them at the same time, which means an overall reduction in how much um, access to that that the children have got overall. Um, and I guess it's probably affected mindsets a little bit in terms of people wanting to be out where others are, because um, particularly in the UAE, we've got a you know a, a smaller window of when we can access all those facilities and places and spaces. So maybe it's changed mindsets. But I, I honestly have to admit that because for 
again, I'm lucky in that it's built into the DNA of our school, but it hasn't really changed because it's a long view. It's changing sustainability and eco-literacy in the long view, not just changing it for now. So our children very, very quickly become eco-warriors. They, they flick overnight to, to not using plastics and to being just amazed at how... I think we can't. Can you hear Brett or is it only me? No. No? Okay. I think his connection is a bit bad. Maybe Hind, uh, 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 we'll wait for Brett to come back, but if you could comment from your perspective, you mentioned that you're doing the workshops remotely and all that, but how does maybe Bia see this whole thing from a bigger perspective and, and all that? So Yeah. Uh, I mean, as you mentioned, like when we went during the lockdown period, the quarantine period, the environmental impacts were actually positive. So as you said, we're seeing clear blue skies, a reduction in air pollution, you know, like everything became better. So we don't want to say that it had a positive impact, but it did in a way on the environment. And I think that maybe um, enlightened a lot of people and brought the attention more, you know, into focus because a lot of them knew that, you know, advocating for the environment is something that's, you know, important. But I think now more than ever, it became more relevant and more important. If you think about it, like, focusing on environmental fields and having careers when it comes to environmental and sustainability became something that is very relevant right now. If we go back 10 years, it wasn't something that was very common. Like even when I went to university, like back then years ago, it was a fairly new major. So a lot of people didn't really understand, you know, if you said environmental sciences, what, what does it really mean? But right now it's a very known subject. And I think like the shift and everything that's happening with COVID is pushing people more into that direction and pushing them more to focus on, you know, sustainability and environmental management and actually taking care for, you know, the environment because they did see, you know, just by having being locked down for a very small period, how it did a huge impact. So imagine if everyone, you know, starts practicing sustainable uh, lifestyle, what huge impact that would have on, you know, the overall planet and health. Yeah. Th thank you. And then I, I, Personally, I, I I exactly had the same thoughts, and maybe it was kind of a wake up call that you think that, like within within a few weeks, you you, you really got like all these blue skies and everything. So how how we can impact that? Brett, there was technical issues. Uh, do you want to finish your sentence? So <laughs> I thought you just shut me down because you had enough. Um, no, as I think I got to the point of saying for our kids, it was. Uh, it, it, it's been okay. We've been able to manage. So I listened to what Hin, Hin said there on the positive side. There's definitely been a raising awareness. So that's yeah. enough from us. Okay, Elena, any thoughts? Or, any thoughts on on this one? Yeah, you mentioned uh, wake up call, and earlier in the beginning, you said that that when the COVID came, we like we instantly did everything we could or or at least we try to just act in a couple of days but this is just my opinion I, i'm maybe a little bit afraid that after the covid if it, if we go to the after after period so are we just so tired and exhausted that we coped the covid so do we still have power and strength to think about the the climate issues or other big issues or are we just like so tired we can't take it anymore i don't know this is just yeah. something i've been thinking yeah and i think it's maybe a bit too early to say but time time will tell yeah peter yeah i mean i i can see it sort of from from sort of personal sort of angle and, and what I've seen as far as business as well from you know engagement with schools that when when I was coming into 2020 there was a real sort of positive move towards more sustainability in schools more action more I mean through not just Greta Thunberg but all I mean so David Attenborough's uh, you know this um, programs and all sorts of things it was very very positive so the media was all over climate change as well I think when the pandemic hit literally it was about survival you know literally survival and also with scores it was about adapting to just a completely different world so things went really really quiet i think people were just interested in getting through the pandemic understanding the impact how they had to adapt 
just going on a day-to-day survival basis basically but just in the last few weeks especially in the turn of the year a lot more schools have been communicating with me and engaging with me about ideas on how to become more sustainable how to engage students because to quote one they're they're fed up with screens they're fed up with covid they want to do something meaningful really a a long-term meaningful thing you know a, a target that's that really means um, safety for the future of our children and that's that's the long-term approach which in the past maybe hasn't been there I so I, I'm very positive actually you know obviously there's there's huge amounts of impact that's had on plastic waste you know only because it had it's, it's just there wasn't any much choice really but I think the the engagement with schools is is happening a lot more and I, I assume that's the case with with other organizations and and uh and networks and i'm really positive i mean 2022 people talk about 2020 being a change year i think actually 2022 when when hopefully things have settled down and people are sort of back well like i said to you in our discussions before there is there is no normal because going back to normal wasn't working it just wasn't working so we have to adapt and change anyway and i think i think schools have had time to reflect on that i think people have had time to reflect on that so I, I think it's I think it's positive. I really do. Yeah, and maybe yes, we use a lot more like plastic and all that. But then if we look at the air traffic, if we look at maybe people are eating healthier, which usual usually healthier food is is better for the environment and 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 things like that. Like hopefully hopefully this 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 will uh, this will be so, something positive for the future. Okay, so. Hey, and I'm- so yes. <laughs> I'm really glad that Peter like like brought up the bright lights of what I say, but that was just a thought. I'm I'm positive too. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's good to be realistic. Well, and, and I guess we're, we're all here pretty scientific, so we don't yet have enough data, right? So <laughs> to, to see to see how it goes. Okay. So any 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 last thoughts or comments? We have only like one and a half minutes left in this talk. Anyone wants to raise something? I've just got a question in the, in the question and answer chat. Yeah. I, I, the, Suggestions in Kuwait. If if that person, whoever guest five nine three is, if they can contact me somehow, I will happily put them in touch with some people that I uh, I sort of work with over there. Um, virtually. Yeah, I think uh, there is a way to connect through this platform itself, actually. So, uh, like uh, through the registration to the event, I've been getting some messages as well. So I think through there, and I think you're you're on LinkedIn as well, as well. Uh, Peter, or are you on Twitter? I'm on, <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on Twitter as well, yeah, I'm on Twitter. Okay, perfect, okay. Yeah. Very good. So I think, uh, yeah, there was a question about COVID. We we, we covered that. And, and thank you, everyone, for a, for a very uh, an interesting and great discussion. I would really like to have this talk in 2022 and, and see if that would be the year that, that changes everything. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, to you, Barney. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for sharing your experiences and insight there. Um, I'm, I know how much our audience really value that. Um, just for our audience, before we finish, um, you'll be redirected to a short survey at the end of the session. So please do just take a couple of minutes um, more out of your day to complete this as it really helps us putting our, our future events together. Um, don't forget, we're also on social media um, during the events. Please do tweet us at Guest Education and use the hashtag Guest Global and share um, everything you're enjoying about the event. So, um, yeah, just one final big thank you to everyone on the panel and to everyone that's tuned in. Uh, and I can just, I'd just like to point you to our next live session um, here on the live stream, which is Michelle's, Michelle Borber's keynote presentation, Seven Teachable Tra- Traits to Ensure Students' Happiness and Lifelong Success, which is coming up at um, half past six uh, GST. So we hope you enjoy the rest of the event and thank you again uh, to all of our panellists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.